And we will move on to the next presentation by Dr. Nana Rose, who is from the Department of Nutrition, Exercise and Sports in the University of Copenhagen from Denmark. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the introduction. Um, well, talking about underused foods for key nutrition, we have to put it into the nutritional context of the uh, nutritional challenges that uh, we want to look for these underused, underused foods. So I uh, want to bring in this uh, global perspective of our nutritional challenges. Here it's presented by food, a categorizing of food systems which was uh, suggested in the Global Nutrition Report recently published by IFPRI. And um, well, this morning we already covered very extensively on the problems of overnutrition. Um, and we see if we move here from the industrialized, uh, industrialized food system through the more transitional food systems to uh, what we will find in typical developing countries, we have this gradient that the overnutrition is in well, in this part of the world, while we still have very, very large population groups that are still suffering from the classical undernutrition problems of micronutrient deficiencies, uh, stunted child growth, and its uh, very health and even life-threatening conditions. I'm bringing this in because when we look into the dietary patterns characterizing these food systems uh, with the related nutritional problems, uh, we see this very steep gradient in the balance between animal source foods and stable food intake. So where, when we talk about, uh, well, maybe that we, in this end of the scale has a too high and unnecessarily high intake of animal source food, uh, this dietary pattern actually uh, seems to be a very key underlying reason for the undernutrition problems that we see in uh, large populations outside Europe. So my focus for this presentation and also in much of the research I'm involved in is to look for underused animal source foods since this, this is where we can find the nutrient dense foods which can make a uh, difference in the diets uh, in the case of uh, undernutrition. So where to look? Well, most of our livestock and, uh, and food producing animals are mammals and birds and uh, even that we just saw that the uh, squirrels could be brought in and so on. I think when we talk about scaling up mass production, think, uh, foods that really can make uh, a substantial difference, I don't think we will see much new, new productions coming out of these groups, group of animals. Fish and seafoods is interesting, uh, as this is really increasing the supply we have now more fish supplied from agriculture than from fisheries. So over the fi last 50 years, it has, uh, we have seen new species being brought from wild population, being domesticated. Tilapia, Atlantic salmon, you can all find it in your supermarkets. It's all very recently uh, domesticated and uh, mass-produced species. So before turning to the uh, last group that I will uh, cover more in details about the insects. Uh, well, this is just an example from what I was involved in in identifying underused species uh, here, indigenous small fish species in Bangladesh, really many of them aquarium fish species. We, we, um, we um, looked for key nutrient, found a high variation. This is just an example for the vitamin A content, ranked from very low contents in the bottom, very high contents in the top. And all the culture species had the very low content. So by actually identifying this one species, we were able, together with the fisheries researchers, to integrate it into fish ponds together with these species, cash species, and we got a much better nutritional outcome. So this is how I will view uh, 
that an underused species has contributed key nutrient and is now part of the fish aquaculture production systems in Bangladesh. So what about this food group of insects, which uh, we are turning our eyes on more recently? Well, we already saw these uh, presentations from uh, Klaus that, uh, well, insects are not, are not new in the human diet. Uh, this is by species. We don't have figures on, actual, on amounts of consumption, but we also see that it's very culturally um, determined. We have a high variation, and uh, Europe is very white on this map. Just zooming in on Africa, where we say, well, we have this maybe common picture, then, well, if, we, if it's a continent, either eat insects or not. But it's extru it, it is very culturally determined, and even within, uh, within population groups in the same country, there can be very different perception of uh, which sp insect species you actually regard. People will normally not say, well, I eat insects. They have the perception, I eat termites, I eat crickets, I eat grasshoppers, but I don't eat insects. So what nutritionally? Well, we are talking about uh, hundreds of thousands of species, so it's uh, quite broad to cover, but here are just examples of five species, three on the larvae stages, three in the adult stages. For the, If we look at the macronutrient composition, well, basically we can say that it's, uh, um, it's, it's an animal source food in terms of its protein, its fat, and variable uh, combinations, and especially when we have the larvae stages, it's highly variable because it's a very morphologically changing uh, stage of uh, life stage of, 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 uh, of these animals. Um, we also, I could show you the same thing for the micronutrients, high variation, but basically we see it as a, as a nutrient dense foods. We still remain to have the, uh, the, the, the studies on the bioavailability of the, of the, of the minerals, but uh, basically, yes, insects are a valuable nutrient-dense animal source foods. So how can we bring these insects um, from being, well, if they are underused, uh, to supply more key nutrients in the future diets? Well, um, we... It's already a contribution from the wild sources. We don't really know how much it, uh, it contributes for nutrition because it's simply not assessed. But uh, it's not sustainable just to go out and collect more and more and more. So what is, uh, what is the, the future is which species can we bring into mass production in, in, in managed systems like we have our livestock. So these are Turning from the 2,000 species that is collected from the wild, uh, farming insects is a completely different picture. We have some cricket species, mealworms, locusts, some fly species for animal feeds, and then we use byproducts from the two, only two existing insect products we have, the honeybees and the silk production. So, well, at present, we are narrowing down to very few species. There will probably come more, but it's still the two. It's completely a different scale of number of production system compared to what we see from the wild collection. Well, just since this is such a new area, well, just briefly, how does this look like? Well, this is a presentation from the, this EFSA report. Oh, we can see it's the references here that came out last week. Uh, well. We have the production side of the chain where we feed the insects with a substrate uh, and harvest them um, according to which life stage they are suitable for either feed and food. We have a harvest. This one with livestock it will be a slaughtering process. Here is the harvest. We call it harvest. And we have processing either as a whole insect or we can, we can make isolates of proteins and fats. And it goes into consumers into pet food, into feed for animals. 
And these are just snapshots to say, well, how does this look like in the real life? Well, here are cricket production in a pen system in Thailand, which is, uh, has developed very fast over the past 15 years, and they now have a full processing of processed foods, uh, food chain. Mealworm production from some European producers, um, where it's a cage system here, much going, going, aiming for automatization of the processes here, separating the, the insects from the substrate. And here, black soldier fly production from uh, industrial scale production in the US, where uh, for animal, this is for aquaculture feed, uh, feeding in uh, feeding these uh, larvae, feed, uh, insect larvae, uh, on different organic waste materials. So, is this a part of the future system? That's what we are dealing with. That's what we are asking ourselves. Um, and as mentioned, the risk profile or the scientific opinion from EFSA, uh, where. I was, on the, uh, I was a part of the working group behind the report, and it came out last week and uh, covers potential biological, chemical, environmental hazards. And um, it's only on the farm insects. It's not the 2,000 species. It's the list of the few, about 10, uh, 15 species that can be identified on a global level being uh, somehow farmed on uh, on uh, for, for, for scaled up production. So what is the summary? Well, as I said, it now you can access it online. Well, um, we, we need to go production system by production system, insect species by insect species. Well, we can say if we, this is a produce and food producing animal, if we use the allowed feed materials, uh, there don't seem to be any additional risk compared to other uh, proteins of any uh, animal origin. And uh, well, so the question is now, well, what about using all the other substrates, the food waste, the organic waste streams, that we, which could be a part of the production system and in that way solving two problems at the same time. Um, the report summarizes the hazards here for biological, for prions, for chemical hazards. You can, and here it depends on what do we feed these, anim, uh, these insects on and the different feed, so potential feed stream, uh, substrates are classified here. That we can feed animals on human manure and sewage sludge. What does it mean for the, uh, for the hazards? This is uh, systems that exist out, outside Europe. There is a lot of unknowns, which is not a big surprise since these systems are not in place. So, uh, of course, this is something that needs to be, uh, to, needs to be uh, documented as, uh, uh, as we go along. So, does insect has a role in the future uh, diet? Um, well, a few more aspects before I close. We know this about, well, more and more people consume processed foods. It's not only in the urban populations, it's very much also in the rural populations out where we have the nutritional, undernutrition problem. And another important aspect for the global perspectives is, of course, this about, well, promoting increased animal, so animal source production to address some of these uh, nutritional, undernutrition problems. What are the perspectives in terms of the climate and resource burden, water, the water, the land use, and, and the, and the uh, greenhouse gas emission? Well, for the processed food, we, we don't have a clear picture in it by now. But if you look at the internet, there is a lot of commercial entrepreneurs out there um, um, making insect-based products. And uh, you can find many of them on, on Twitter. We, of course, don't know, have a documentation of the nutritional quality by now. What is, we can say in general, about insects? We have also used, worked on it in our research project. They're quite easy to process uh, and, uh, and, and to handle. So, so that could be one uh, advantage for actually that, that they could uh, be integrated in processed food. For the undernutrition, well, in the perspective of 
uh, of uh, what should be what 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 can make a difference what are the intervention needed we are looking quite a lot into the quality of food aid also about the perspectives about protein quality that was covered by dr futrell earlier today what are healthy growth um, we do RCT studies in developing countries and we can see some component of animal source pro protein needs is needed in the children to get uh, sufficient growth. And what we see now is that the, these eight broad food aid uh, uh, products for children by now contain milk. And can we substitute the milk, for instance, by uh, insects. Well, we have just, besides other studies that we have done, not specifically on insects, we just completed a school feeding pro uh, a small school feeding project in Kenya, where we could see comparing a, a biscuit with crickets and milk, and there was completely fine acceptability. It actually had a better nutritional profile. Uh, we can produce this locally. There was something, well, the children would happily eat the biscuits. They have some, uh, something about the appearance and the texture, but this is something that can be worked on. So what about the, um, so what about in Europe and in our diets? We have this huge choice of foods. We have already an excess supply of animal source foods. Do we need do we need insects in our diets? Well, from a gastronomic perspective, where we work with the Nordic Food Lab in Copenhagen, associated with the restaurant Noma, they are looking into insects for diversity of tastes. This was the serving as the EU Parliament had a press conference for a couple of weeks ago. So it's with the ants and with the bee brood and some uh, crickets. Um, so, um, this is one track, is that it adds diversity to our, whether we need it nutritionally is, has to be seen in the dietary context. I think it's worth to say, well, when e people eat insects around the world, they don't do this as a hunger food. It's very much viewed as a delicacy. Here, crickets in Cambodia. This is a grilled tarantula. Um, this uh, happy Kenyan uh, boy is eating termites. And these are some palm weevil, uh, grilled palm weevil from Thailand. The last perspective, which is uh, very important, especially in this uh, emphasis on the need for animal source food supplies in certain populations. Um, well, what about the insects will and this uh, challenge of the burden on our global resources? These are experimental insect production systems. I have to emphasize that. Comparing the greenhouse gas emission with some of our existing livestock uh, uh, product production, where especially we know that the cattle is extremely burdening. And it appears like that here we actually would have an production systems which could be much, much less burdening on climate compared to what, what we have. So this is definitely an aspect that needs to be considered uh, for the potential of uh, bringing insects much more into our formalized um, uh, food systems. So, in summary, uh, are insects underused foods for key nutrition? Well, the sustainability of the scaling up of the exploration of the 2,000 species that we can see is already eaten is simply limiting the contribution. Maybe there are species out there we could collect in large amounts, but uh, it's not just the way uh, to start. We are going for, we are looking for scaled up mass production in managed systems, which can um, avoid the over exploration, but also it's much more uh, confined to, uh, to, to uh, secure for, for, for food safety that we can follow the whole production chains. It will be a limited number of species 
and we will go along species by species for production systems. Um, and they can, there's no doubt that insects can contribute key nutrition to food systems that's are lacking this supply of animal protein by now. And it can contribute to our dietary and gastronomic diversity in our part of the world. Um, and we have this uh, promising perspective that insects can actually contribute to a more sustainable and less climate burdening of our diets in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting topic, insects. I can see the hands are already there. Oh, several hands are already up. Thank you, Andreas Cardi from EDE. Um, I have one question with regard to mass farming of insects. Uh, when we look into food law in Europe, uh, we also have to consider the environmental impact of things we are doing. And um, uh, while we have also long discussions on separating GMO crops from non-GMO crops in agriculture, uh, because there can be passive movement of seeds, for example. What about the potential environmental impact of, for example, um, millions of grasshoppers being farmed? Because when they are released into the environment in an uncontrolled way, this can be really a big damage to the agriculture in the whole country. So I haven't read the EFSA report yet, so probably you may have uh, covered that there, but it would be interesting to know your thoughts, how we approach that when it comes to good agricultural practices and the potential impact if these organisms are released into the environment because they are there in, in, in big numbers. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This uh, is, of course, a very fundamental consideration. And uh, it's, uh, it's not covering the EFSA report, but the question about uh, risk of fauna uh, pollution is, uh, is, of course, important. And we need to consider uh, introductions. Uh, if, if species uh, can actually survive in the environment that they are introduced in production systems. A species like black soldier fly, is, uh, which is expanding in these industrial systems, uh, have the advantage of that they have a very short adult uh, uh, life stage, and they don't fly very much, uh, very long, and they don't survive in a non-tropical environment. Actually, for the grasshoppers, is um, um, it is a concern, and actually in Thailand, where they purposely and uh, very systematic developed the cricket production systems, and this, they were considering different species, and they excluded grasshoppers exactly for that reason, that they didn't want to take the risk that you have these production systems out in the villages and you have suddenly you have a release that actually would do more damage. So that was actually a very, uh, a, 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 that was a decision that was made at that time. It's not that they have regulations that you are not allowed to, to, um, uh, to, 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 to farm grasshoppers, but uh, for the purpose of uh, developing this system, which was uh, centered at the Konkan University in, 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 uh, in Thailand, it was decided, let's go for crickets because of the, we have less risk. Uh, Mikolaj Gralak, uh, Warsaw University of Life Sciences. I have a simple question. Are insects a good source of cyanocobalamin, I mean vitamin B12? I'm asking especially in a, a Name of the people who are vegetarians or even vegan, vegans. Well, um, <coughs> we do not have a complete picture of, uh, we, do have, we do not have analyzed all the species of insects that we want to do. To, to, and uh, what I have seen of B12, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's okay. Um, so, um, I cannot give you a, a complete answer to that. We need to look at the species uh, that are of, of relevance. So, um, but of course, it's it's important. It's, it, it's well, it's important in the vegetarian diets that it could be a source, and it's definitely important in the diets uh, in developing countries where they with the lack of animal source food.
Christian Schlecht dem Fraunhofer IME. Hello. Thanks for this very interesting uh, talk. Um, you started your, your talk with some slides on aquaculture. And during the last decade, we had a, a, a strong shift from marine-derived resources in the aquaculture diets to plant-derived resources. And uh, in this case, um, inducing the potential for contamination, contaminant transfer to aquaculture products is a very big discussion at the moment, um, also with the BFR and BVL in Germany and also the European Commission. Um, I was wondering, are there any information on the transfer of contaminants from plant-derived resources into insects? Well, you could see in the um, overview of hazards uh, uh, that I have, that was in a very, in, in, a, very, in a shortened version in, in, in uh, one of the slides that for the, for the chemical hazards we have really unknowns, so uh, there, uh, we cannot say it in general, we really have to go. Um, there are some studies uh, that, that we can have heavy metal uh, accumulation in some insect species. Um, so, uh, and, and we have to look more into, to, into that, but we really have to go in species by species, production system by production system, like we do for aquaculture and for livestock. So, so, so I think the next step is that we are moving away from just talking about insects, but to talk about, well, we have black soldier fire production system. These are the risks of accumulation. If there are any of these, we have cricket production systems, and, and then we have to, to take it step by step. Westendorf from Hamburg, Germany. Uh, one important uh, benefit of insects uh, on the economic point is that, uh, that they transform uh, plants uh, much more efficiently into proteins than, than the farm animals do. And they can also use a much uh, wider uh, uh, variety of, of species. So I think this will, will get more and more important also for Europe. And this makes them much more interesting than, than just uh, uh, their exotic taste might be. Yes. Ex yes, exactly. And this is, uh, this is the important perspective which uh, a kind of is summarized in this uh, greenhouse gas emission where you cover from the whole production. Of course, we need to do it for, for, for scaled, up com scaled up insect production systems to get a clear picture. Um, but it, it is really where insects brings in a completely new dimension of animal source uh, production since we here actually have the uh, possibility to upgrade low uh, low grade organic waste even uh, even even manure if if it can be uh, if it can be documented for basic safety issues but we can actually upgrade uh, low nitrogen sources to oops, to high to, to a high value protein source so uh, it's 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 it has really um, a broad perspective for the future and it can add to solve some of the waste food waste problems that uh, we are also dealing with but of course it should be done in a, in a in a safe the, the, in a safe way, so there is, but uh, as, uh, well, the EFSA report is long and we go through what is available from, from the scientific literature uh, and there are unknowns. I think what is a bit promising uh, maybe is to say, well, there's, some, no, there's nothing, there's no indication that there are generic risks associated with insects, R risks just because it's insects. It's all connected to the production systems and uh, actually follow much of the, uh, well, the hazards that we have in other animals. Uh, we have heard earlier today, well, foods are not, uh, well, there are risks associating with eating foods. Um, so, so, so 
The promising thing is that I don't see that there are something specific to say, well, insects are, have this risk because they're insects. Insects has risk because we produce them in, as an animal production systems, and it's basically the same risks. For, microbi for, 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 um, for the microbiological risks, we don't see indications, for instance, that um, insect pathogens, viruses, for example, that makes, that's, makes the insects sick are transferred or have any risks for humans or mammals. It's the microbiological hazards is associated with the contaminated uh, uh, mi microbiological uh, uh, components. It's not something which is because it's an insect. We have to move on. We still have one more presentation. Thank you very much, Nano. Mm -hmm.